Hello everyone. Hi, my name is Shian Shajit. I'm from University of Waterloo. I want to thank the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to stand here and talk in front of you guys. The name of my title is Laser Damage Creates Backdoor in Quantum Communication. This talk is mainly about security of quantum communication. So we know the security or unconditional security is based on three things. We first make some assumptions, we use laws of physics, and then we make some model of our devices. Let's assume we, uh, our modeling is D prime. And then we mix them up and end up into unconditional security. This whole thing is done in theory, and as long as these trees are perfect, we can say with certainty that unconditional security is guaranteed. Then we move on to actually implement the device. We use a practical device with property D and implement our system. Then we try our base to make sure that D equals to D prime. That is, there is no gap between our theory and our actual implementation. But in this work, we ask the question, what if an eavesdropper has the power to create a gap? That means after everything is characterized, after we made sure that D equals to D prime, is it possible for an eavesdropper to create a gap from the channel? Well, the normal answer is yes. An eavesdropper can always stay in the line and shoot high power laser into our system so that there is a deviation and D becomes D prime. But the more specific question would be, what would be the consequence? What if a deviation is created? Is it going to lead to a compromise of security or is it going to be a denial of service? This is what we do in this work and we test it experimentally on two different systems. The first system is this one, which is a free space QKD system that is used for long distance satellite QKD. A schematic of the system is like this. It's a passive basis choice scheme, having a beam splitter to send the photon either in HB or DA basis, and these two lenses are for focusing and collimation only. In the last Q crypt, it was already presented that this kind of uh, scheme suffer from special efficiency mismatch loophole. So what is that? Well, if an eavesdropper stays in the line and send light at different angle, it has been proved that the efficiency of the four detectors very differently and there are certain attack angles that can be exploited by the eavesdropper. For example, if light is sent at this angle, the detector V has a relatively higher efficiency than the other three detectors and if can always send light at this angle and control detector V. Similar angle exists for the other three detectors. So all these were presented in the last few crypt and it was suggested that to close this loophole, a special filter is needed so that if light is sent at different angles, it will be blocked and only the light that is going straight through the axis will be passed. So this was the side channel block and this is pretty confirmed now. Well, in this work, we tried to see if by laser damage, an eavesdropper can break this thing. So our experiment started with three steps. The first step was the scanning step. We started scanning while the spatial filter was there. And this is the result. As you can see, while the spatial filter is there, there is no mismatch. Then we went on to our second step, which is the damage. We replaced our scanning laser with a high power laser and started shooting at the pinhole. We have a video of this actual experiment and let me show it to you. So you can see this is the actual pinhole and now we're going to send a high power laser. So you can see as soon as we sent that high power laser, it started burning the pinhole and what was only a 25 micrometer pinhole has been broadened to a 200 micrometer pinhole. So this was our damage step. Then we went on to our scanning step and we did our scanning again and this is the result. So as there is more white pinhole, if can send light again at different angles and the, diff the four detectors vary differently and the four attack angles have been recreated. So in summary, at first we show by scanning, it was perfectly secure and characterized. We damaged, created a deviation and made the system insecure. This is an example that an eavesdropper from the line can send high power light and create a deviation which in turn makes the system insecure. We move on to our second example which we tested on Clavis system. This is the system. The schematic looks like this. It's a plug and play system. So in a plug and play system, Bob actually have the laser. He sends the laser to Alice. Alice does the necessary encoding, attenuation and send it back to Bob. So this kind of system is pretty easy to implement and it avoids all the technical problems that other systems have, but it suffers from a problem. 
if while the light is going towards Alice, if an eavesdropper adds some extra energy in the line, it will go in and come out with the actual encoding information. So this is the problem. In order to avoid this problem, this system has this pulse energy monitoring detector. So what happens if some extra light goes in, it is divided, some goes to this quantum channel, while the other goes to this pulse energy monitoring detector and it looks for the extra light. So in this way, some extra light injection is prevented. Well, in this work, we decided to laser damage this particular thing. So we replaced our if and started sending high power laser. And this is the result. So this is how an undamaged detector looks like. But when we inserted one watt, we saw the sensitivity of the detector loses by 1.6 dB. If we kept in increasing our laser, our power at 1.5, the sensitivity decreases by 5.5 dB. We still increase the power at 1.7 watt, the laser or the detector completely lost its photosensitivity. So it doesn't detect anymore. It was already uh, presented in a previous script in this paper that for a QKD system using this device, full security is compromised when the pulse energy monitoring sensitivity loses 0.8 dB for BB84 for BB84 protocol and for SARC protocol, uh, it loses its security when the sensitivity drops by 3.2 dB. The same paper also shows that when this plug and play system is used for quantum coin tossing, all kind of quantum advantages disappears when the sensitivity loses by 2.6 dB. So you can see this amount of power actually decreases the sensitivity by 5.5 dB. So it is enough to compromise the security for all the true systems mentioned here. So this was the second example where we again show that laser damage can in practice create a deviation that might be harmful for the security of the system. I just uh, gave a summary, but interested users can, interested people can look into this paper that was published just yesterday. It has all the technical details of this work. So before I go to conclusion, I want to make one more point. In the two examples that I mentioned, both actually cause a compromise in security, but it doesn't mean it's going to do the same thing for all the cases. For example, in this case, when we burned this pinhole, there is every chance that some extra light will go through here and burn these four detectors. If this is the case, it doesn't, uh, what, it doesn't lead to a compromise of security. Rather, it leads to a denial of service. Fortunately, in this case, it didn't happen because there was a band pass filter. It was there to prevent every other wavelength and we, we used a different wavelength. So in this way, we were safe, or maybe Eve was safe to burn this. Similarly, in this system, we tried to burn this detector. Because if you look at the coupler, it's 90%, then again 90%. So most of the light went through this detector. However, if some light went to this detector, it could have burned the sync detector, and synchronization would be lost, and it would be again a denial of service. So all the two examples I gave, it led to the security, but there is also a good chance that instead of leading to a compromise in security, it can actually lead to a denial of service. And this gives us an idea for a, for a countermeasure. So we could always make the system design in such a way that excess laser leads to a denial of service before it compromises the security. So if we change our system in such a way, it can be a possible countermeasure. Of course, there are two other countermeasures. We can always monitor for deviation. We can always monitor for laser damage, but these are too much complicated work and much more future work is needed to be done. There can be a third countermeasure that is prevent laser damage. We know in electrical circuit, we use electrical fuse. Whenever excess current goes through, the wire burns down. Similarly, we could actually manufacture uh, something like this fiber fuse, so that if extra light goes through it, it burns down. And if we put this thing in front of our system, any kind of laser damage could be prevented. So these three can be a countermeasure to prevent laser damage. And now, yeah, we went to our conclusion. So I want to finish my conclusion by saying that since the start of quantum cryptography in the ocean in Puerto Rico in 1979, we have come down a long way. So Alice and Bob has gone stronger. We have found different methods, different tools, like decoy state, MDI QKD, device independent QKD, that are causing our period higher and higher and making our system more secure and secure. However, we should not be satisfied. We should not forget that Eve is also waiting because there is every chance that Eve is also going stronger and stronger and developing new tools to make our system insecure. So, as a member of the QKD community that promises to provide unconditional security, I would like to, I like to believe that we should do enough to prevent that this cannot happen. And I want to finish my note on this talk. Thank you.
Questions? Uh, so when you burn the pinhole our detectors, yep. will the user will smell something strange? <laughs> so this can be a simple countermeasure to our attack, right? <laughs> so uh, is your question when I burn the pinhole, uh, the user detects something? Uh, I was there like two feet away. I didn't smell anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. The sound was uh, added by myself. Actually, yeah, by my supervisor, Vadim. Yeah. <laughs> the, actually, there was no sound. Yeah. Um, does the fiber fuse exist so far? Uh, people are actually uh, working on this, but I saw in YouTube video that the, this kind of fiber fields actually exist. So uh, when light goes through a uh, fiber, if the light density goes over a certain threshold, it starts a kind of fuse and it propagates backward. So this kind of thing actually exists. Is it based on, on a chemical process? Uh, it's based on something related with the impurity. As far as I know, I'm not 100% sure, but the presence of impurity or something actually causes that burning and it propagates back backwards. So there are actually few videos in YouTube with fiber fuses. So you can actually uh, look at them. There are very nice videos. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.